And I, I'm going to try to give you an idea that's not only worth sharing, but possibly an idea that is worth growing. And what we work on is trying to take plants or parts of plants and redeploy them to where we can make energy. And this particular energy that we want to make is photosynthetic energy in the form of electricity. And so we're really going to take the process that's been primarily responsible for all of the energy that we use in fossil fuels, and we're going to try to fast forward that process so that we can do it in real time. Okay? Okay, so we all, one of the challenges in society is that we've become terribly addicted to electricity. It's estimated that this year we're going to have actually more uh, internet accessing devices in the form of smartphones than we actually have people on the planet. And this trend is all requiring more and more electricity to drive these devices. Uh, if you look at a, a size satellite photo of the, of the Earth, you can see that, that it's really quite remarkable how much electricity is being used just to illuminate the planet. This is all nighttime lighting. And if you do a projection for the next 50 or so years, you can see that not only is our energy going up, but electrical energy is going up even faster. And so the demands for electricity are going to continue to grow. This is even more challenging when you consider that about a third of the planet, two billion people, don't have access to electricity yet. When they do have access, they're going to continue to uh, require the same electrical appliances, electrical devices, internet accessing devices. And so the process will continue to grow. We estimate that in Asia alone, the increased electrical demands are going up at 4% a year. Now, we have hopes that we could satisfy this. Now, we've heard about the energy crisis. We've heard about global warming. We know that our fossil fuels shown here in these three colors are essentially going to be depleted. We're going to have some sort of peak uh, access. It was projected to be soon. Uh, now with uh, fracking and other uh, uh, new technologies that may be further in the future, we thought we could rely heavily on nuclear power. However, after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, uh, many countries, Japan has gone completely offline. Germany is expected to be offline by 2022. Renewable technologies like hydroelectric, which is very common in East Tennessee with TVA, and things like solar and wind are quite attractive, but we realize that those themselves will not fill in the gap. Most people feel that the only solution we have to fill this new energy requirement is the sun itself, and specifically this process, photovoltaics. And so photovoltaics w is what drives a solar cell. We know about solar cells. You see them. They're becoming deployed. They have typical efficiencies of 10 or 20 percent. And what they do is they take the sun, they take the photons, and they convert it through a process known as a photoelectric effect into an electron. Now this would appear to be a great solution, a solution that we could possibly deploy. And so you start to ask the question, well, how much land would it take to satisfy these new electrical needs? And so it's been calculated if you take a pretty efficient, actually about a 20 percent efficient solar cell, and try to fulfill all of the world's energy needs, you could do it with an area approximately the size of Spain, which I show up here. And that seems like a pretty small region. The rest of the world is in green here. Um, <laughs> the, the hope that we're not going to put it all in Spain. The idea is that you could deploy it in a distributed fashion. And so this little surface area has now been distributed around the world. And this region in the Saharas is actually big enough to satisfy all of Europe. Okay. So the thought is that if you can go into regions where the sun shines a lot, they have a lot of solar radiation, there's a lot of open land, there's not a lot of population, there's not a lot of vegetation, that maybe we could provide this. So there's been a lot of optimism until people started looking more deeply at the process and how do you make these devices. Uh, it turns out that they're all mostly today being made out of inorganic materials, somewhat esoteric in inorganic materials, compounds like terillium and indium and ruthenium, things you may have never heard of. And yet we know how much ruthenium and indium and terillium there is on the planet. And it turns out that if you were to use all of it, all that the geologists know about anywhere in the world, and collectively put them into these different solar cells, these are different technologies, CAD terillium, CIGS, disensitized, they all require these chemicals, these compounds that simply aren't abundant. And we are not able at this point with the known reserves to be able to build solar cells to give you this large surface area here. There's simply not enough resources available. So we call that resource limitation. So it's been projected that by 2100 we could only accommodate, if we used everything on the planet, 4% of the solar energy uh, or, or electrical energy via solar cell. 
So there has to be another strategy. We have to have a sustainable, a renewable a mechanism that's not going to be resource limited. Uh, we often have thought of photosynthesis as the process that gives us our food. You may not realize that it's also the process that gives you all of your oxygen. It's also the process that has given you through time all of the fossil fuels, okay? So it's not too surprising that in this, this sort of this green movement that the logo that is so commonly used is something related to the process of photosynthesis and very commonly it's the leaf itself. And so what we've tried to do is take that leaf not from a figurative sense but from a biological process and take advantage of it. Now, photosynthesis is what drives most of the new bioenergies that you've heard of. This can be uh, bioethanol, biodiesel, things like that. Now one of the, the sort of disappointments of that is that plants are very good at reproducing and making seeds, growing flowers and reproducing, but they're not very efficient at converting photons into electrons, okay? If you look at the, uh, what we would call the energy conversion efficiency, which tells you really how good that plant or algae can use light and give you something out, so as we see on the left here, most of them are about a hundredfold less than a typical solar cell. So that means if we go back to that cartoon of Spain, we're going to have to have a hundred times the size of Spain to fulfill that need. Now, we do know something, though, something that we've known a long time. Photosynthesis is actually really, really efficient. And if you go back up in the process, it's a very complex process, but if you go to the very primary process, the process where the photon is converted into an electron, it's been shown that that works with 100% efficiency. Now that's a very attractive process. That means every photon can give an electron. And so solar cells that we're talking about having 20% efficiency could actually be much, much higher than that. And so that amount of land that we were talking about could be much, much smaller. And those resources that are limited could be satisfied by the fact that plants regrow. You can grow them, you can harvest them, you grow them again. So we would really like to try to take that process and move it forward. Now the other issue that is challenging for people that work in the renewable energy arena and in the biofuels arena is that the planet is already sort of struggling with the stress that humanity has put on it. If you look at these various different processes, Shown in green is what we might think of as a safe operating space. This is sort of where the system is able to recover. There's ability to uh, restore itself. But in many areas, especially in these three shown here, the influence of society and mankind and our largely fossil fuel dependent culture has already pushed us beyond essentially that safe tolerance zone. If we take a new strategy of any solar fuel system, in other words, if we start to plant even more and more acres of uh, land in the fossil, in fossil fuel, not fossil fuels, but in biomass producing things, we may continue to exacerbate that process. So what we're going to look at is if we can now go and take the plant itself, the components that make photosynthesis take place, and plug, plug them in directly. And the advantage of this, I had said, was this efficiency that we have, but we also have a lot of evolutionary perfection. Photosynthesis was really one of the first processes that took place on the Earth, we have over maybe four billion years of evolutionary processes. So what we want to do technically and biologically is sort of shown in this red arrow. And don't pay attention to the details, but the idea is to take what really works very well in the area of biology, what four billion years has already given us, and use the innovations which are taking place right now in real time in nanosciences, synthetic biology, and material science, and combine them in a way such that we bypass the need to grow a plant and go through a billion years of geochemical conversion into a fossil fuel and do it very directly. So what we use are the actual key components of the photosynthetic process. The little nanoparticles that live in every plant, in every cell that's photosynthetic, that actually converts light into electricity. These particles are called reaction centers. We know a great deal about them. They're protein complexes. This is an outline of all of the proteins. And sort of tucked very neatly in these little squiggly grooves are where the chlorophyll molecules that interact with the light are going to absorb those photons. We can take these things, either from a cyanobacteria that's a very easy microorganism, sort of like E. coli, or a plant, per technically any plant, and we can extract these things quite easily. So this is a photo from my lab, a cyanobacteria that we can engineer quite easily in the lab. We can go through what is considered quite easy, direct, cost-effective isolation. 
we get these reaction centers, we can look at them, you can see how, how pure they are. You can see that all of these particles look quite the same. These are now going to be taken and put into a device that's going to function and give us some type of energy. Now, we did this originally about 10 years ago. We originally started with spinach. We were able to isolate the complex. We were able to make a solar cell. It doesn't make, it's not a big solar cell. It's a little bigger than a stamp. But we were able to show that if we did that, taking all of the biological systems away, integrating it with a class of compounds called organic semiconductors, we were actually able to make electricity. And this electricity was quite renewable or sustainable. And it came from spinach. And we were able to do this and with our colleagues at MIT. And when we did this, it coincided nearly exactly with the 75th anniversary of Popeye as the marketing <laughs> logo. And I tried to get them interested in using our work, but uh, uh, Popeye logo has just gone open source now, I've understood. OK, so the way this works, uh, I won't bore you with the real technical details, but we take these complexes that are shown here, which are biological. They're proteins. We pull them out of the plant. What they're normally doing is they're taking a low energy electron and they're making a high energy electron. They do that upgrading by the absorption of a photon. So we take that piece out. It's really a nanoparticle that we can isolate. You could almost hold it. You can look at it. And we put it into a, a solar cell that has all of the same designs that the typical solar cell has, but now it's a completely renewable process. And if you were to sort of zoom in on that, you can look, and this is a, a strategy that we've advanced where we've used nanostructured material. This looks like a sort of a shag carpet so that you get a lot more surface area. And the artist's vision is sort of shown here in increasing magnification. Here's the nanostructure of zinc oxide. If you were to look at, these are the reaction centers sort of coating it. Zoom in a little bit closer, you see that sort of trimeric structure. Zoom in even more, you see the chlorophyll. And so when we built that device, we were able to make an extremely efficient solar cell. It was nearly a 1,000 times early, more powerful or more efficient than what we did before. Uh, we were able to show that we could engineer it using what are considered very earth-abundant metals. These are things like zinc and titanium. There's essentially no limitation of zinc and titanium on the planet. And we can do it in such a way that the system works with pretty high efficiency. Now, we're not the only people doing this in the world. There's quite a few scientists that have sort of gotten on to this process. And so recently, we decided to look at what was the collective global progress in using photosynthesis directly. And so we took, and what we have on the, the y-axis is a log scale. So every division is 10 times greater. And we looked at the amount of photocurrent. And this is the amount of electricity that you can generate per square surface area. So we do this amps or microamps per square centimeter. And we did it and looked at all of the recent publications. And you see that you can actually, with a, only a few outliers, generate a quite linear trend. And this linear trend has a slope that's extraordinary. It's, a, it's a basically, we are improving the efficiency of these devices at a fold of tenfold per year, which is much better than Moore's law predicts for integrated circuits, which is only twofold every two years. So now, with only a, maybe two dozen laboratories worldwide, we're able to build a completely sustainable solar producing solar cell or a biological solar cell that's able to improve. We do not know where we're going to get to. Now, we know that we're, these are some of our work that's done up, up here. We know that we're just about at the point now that if you were to take an iPad and put our devices on the back side of it, you could take that iPad out in the sun and you could use that iPad indefinitely. So we're at the point where we're generating essentially enough energy to support a small electrical device by the simple surface area of the size of that device. Now, if we go up higher, this is going to be much better. We're not as high as we could be efficiently. We're probably around about 1% or 0.5%. Our theoretical calculated efficiency with the solar spectrum is 37%, because some of the light isn't absorbed by the chlorophyll. If we do some other things, we can improve that even better. Now, I want to give a little plug that by, by some accident, I think, it turns out that Tennessee is now the world leader in this technology. And all of these, I couldn't, I, I, it's Vanderbilt and UT, I was going to color code them gold and orange, but I just decided to color them all green. So these are all of the recent papers that have come out, really between a collection of people at UT Knoxville and Vanderbilt. And we actually are now working together. So we're pretty, pretty bullish about this. We think that the system 
is developing very nice. We think that there's no real limitation. This can go now at least probably two orders of magnitude further forward. And so to just leave you with sort of a visual image, a sort of a dream, a hope, an idea that we're working towards, is that if you go to a region of, of rich agricultural productivity, this is the Salinas Valley, uh, one of the most productive areas for agriculture in the United States. And this is a field of spinach. And if you look how much spinach they can grow, in Salinas you can grow spinach four cycles a year, you can get enough spinach in one acre in one year to build a solar cell like I've just shown you, that would be 55 acres in size. Now, we don't know the longevity of these devices. When we make them, are they going to work for a week or a year? We know that some of the particles, my colleagues at Vanderbilt have made a solar cell that worked for nearly 280 days with no loss. Okay? So we're fairly bullish. We hope that this type of technology can expand. We hope that we can move into using uh, a, a wide assortment of, of agricultural crops. And in fact, my colleagues at Vanderbilt have actually gone out and made a nice solar cell using our favorite plant, kudzu. Okay? <laughs> kudzu is a noxious weed. It's invasive. It's covering, in many parts of the southeast, 25% of the land. So we could eradicate kudzu and convert it into a solar cell, probably with some of these same technologies. So I'd just like to acknowledge the support. We've been supported almost uh, exclusively by the National Science Foundation. I'm currently supported actually by the Army right now. The Army Research Laboratory has a very forward-thinking view of energy. They're thinking 50 years in advance, not five years. Uh, I want to thank Popeye for the idea that he <laughs> literally got it right. Spinach can give you power. And I want to give a plug for two programs that have supported the students. This is the Sustainability Technology Through Advanced Interdisciplinary Research. This is an NSF IGERT that uh, is currently ongoing. And then TENSCORE, which stands for the Tennessee Solar Conversion Through Outreach, Research, and Education. Thank you.